kind of grooving on the new intro music here. I know, Like right? that? I know. I'm jamming over here. This is lo-fi. I could study to this. Really? I mean, it's I... super nice. It's uh, surprisingly nice. You know, today on this Mutants and Masterminds Monday, um, there is no Facebook. I know. If we stream and oh, there's no. no Facebook, is it even really a stream? Right? Be interesting to see if there's a global drop in violence during this period. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Certainly with my family. <laughs> hey, folks. Uh, we ah, we've got some people who are coming and joining us. Uh, good to see your eyeballs. This is Mutants and Masterminds Monday, where the show must go on. <laughs> That's what the ringleader says, right? They, they right. do. Yeah, they do say that. Hey, is the ringleader just a reference to the? ring master i i think it's a reference to the the circus themed super villain ring leader yes mm -hmm. of I the see. circus of crime uh -huh. or as other people call it working at facebook i ah, just kidding <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> i don't like that ring leader he's an android <laughs> yeah yeah he's definitely something but uh yeah this is our little little pre-show warm-up where we hang out and uh, you know, kind of wait for the crowd to join us. Got some Discord chat. servers in the house. Nice. Ooh. Hello. Uh, Luke, I said nice things about your server while I was at Origins this weekend. You say to nice anyone? things about his server all the time. You sure do. No matter where you are. I do. But there You're... were strangers who wanted to know where they could find good <laughs> M&M games, and I said that's oh. the place. I heard you at the grocery store talking to the checker. Hey. Have you heard of a Pooks Discord I, server? Have you heard the good news, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> it's just me and my white you, polo with my black tie. Have you right. accepted a Pook into your heart? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I certainly have. But yes, yeah, hello to the Freedom City Discord server. And um, yay, form who? Hey, Rainbow. Good to see you, friend. I'm glad you are here. All right, the YouTube's are checking in. YouTube's checking in. We got the Discord's checking in. Um, Twitch may take a minute, uh, but you know what? Uh, we're just going to do it. Uh, you know, it's interesting because we do get the the bulk of our people who kind of check us out live are on Facebook. Right. Nice. Well, and uh, now there's no Facebook, so it's, wow. you know, it's anybody's guess, but that music got really groovy all of a sudden. Now I can't think. <laughs> so what do we little, do? A little distracted. My gator bite still stings. <laughs> I'm sure there's a story there. Wait, wait, a real I mean, gator bite? Florida, maybe yeah. not. My goodness. Well, you know, how about this? Why don't we do this? Mm -hmm. Ta -da! Hi, everybody. Hi. Everybody, it's Mutants and Masterminds Monday. I am your disembodied Troy, and I'm turning down this music because it is so nice. Um, uh, it's nice for once that it's nice and not horrible. Uh, usually, I'm just like, this music is the worst. Uh, but, you know, today we've got a, uh, a newly, a freshly ensconced in the homestead, Crystal Frazier. Hi, everybody. We got our buddy Alex. We've got Steve Kenson. We are all hanging out and to talk to you. And so I kind of described the premise of this show as the care and feeding of your mastermind as it relates to your <laughs> adventure. You you know, kind of the what you're running. But we're just talking about um, uh, some flavors of villainy and um, and how to kind of incorporate that into the uh, games that you are creating. It's kind of on theme. It's, you know, we're getting into the spooky part of the year, uh, my favorite type of the year, which is October. So this being our first show of October, we're kind of easing into it with this discussion. Am I am I close? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good to me. Thanks. Rocky hey, Road is my favorite flavor to villainy, if you're asking, Troy. Mm, Rocky Road. <laughs> <laughs> really, not most tracks. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite Canadian villain. Mm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Sean, Sean Duggan says Facebook is having massive DNS issues. Yes, they sure are. Uh, yes to, uh, I'm seeing, uh, is that Saviera? Yeah. Facebook is having all kinds of problems. Um, but, uh, but you know, we're here, we're here for you. You made it. We're all together, mm -hmm. which is nice. Um, so, uh, why don't Crystal, why don't you dive into some of the, uh, the, what's behind this premise? Oh, uh, today we thought we'd talk a little bit about, you know, 
uh, I mean, we've got, we've talked a lot about, you know, in general villains and balancing encounters and things like that. We thought we'd talk a little bit about how you build a like overarching villainous plot that goes beyond like stealing the baseball diamond. Uh, you know, <laughs> what does your, uh, you know, what is your big villainous plot leading into? How do heroes find out about it? What kind of preparations can a villain take besides just punching people? You know, mm -hmm. building real comic book plots that your heroes have to unravel and before they can eventually face the the mastermind behind everything. And one of them shall die. Yeah. No, I love it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the game is really built for big superhero slugfests, which are, you know, a ton of fun, especially when you're matching like, teams against teams. But what do you do when you want like one big uber villain, like say Mastermind, uh, who's pulling strings and has some big agenda behind the scenes? Because mm -hmm. for your heroes to get involved, they need to find out about it but they don't necessarily need to get the where and the when and the how and the who all at the same time. Uh, so it's, we're kind of talking out like how you build a plot. It's, it's almost mm -hmm. like talking out like how you build adventures for fantasy games in that, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to find the keys to the puzzle. You've got to, you know, figure out where the dungeon is and then you've got to confront, you know, whatever defenders or forces are going on. Mm -hmm. There's, there's really a, a, a careful balance, especially in superhero games, between keeping the heroes engaged and following that trail of investigation or action, but keeping them from jumping right to the end mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the plot at the same time of, you know, how, what, what are the things or the circumstances that keep them from just going right to confronting the master villain and putting a stop to this nonsense, you know, in the first act, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the size of the spoon and how much you put on it when you're spoon-feeding them the clues. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us more <laughs> about that, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that's sort of the, the gist, isn't it? Is a big inciting incident happens, and then mm -hmm. you design a couple of scenes that transition from there, and that interstitial material is the spoon in my mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. Um, and it's about having that big exciting incident. That's the main, that's the main onus on the GM is having an exciting mm -hmm. story hook and a wonderful motivation for the villain. And then I'm the master of mustachery. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, no offense, Alex, you do have a mustache, but you don't really master it. I, mm -hmm. you know, it masters me more often than not. Yeah, I was going to well, say I... the mustache will be your master. <laughs> I was really annoyed with it while I was driving around today. Actually, I kept looking in my rearview mirror, and some of the hairs were going wild. And I was like, "Stop that!" I was thinking more like, you know, um, uh, sort of normal mustache by day, and then by <laughs> by stage light, master mustache comes out. So mm. it's sort of like, you know, you got that's, that's your civilian right. look. Mm. Uh, I just play a mustache master on TV. That's what that's, right. that's right. Yeah. He's, um, he's helpless without hair and makeup. Yeah, well, <laughs> aren't we all? It's true. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> but that is sort of that is sort of coming up with that big scene, having them engage with that, mm -hmm. and then coming up with what little strands that you'll be behind that they could pick up as clues to move on to the next mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. I usually build like a diamond outline. So like I do one scene for the introduction, one scene for the ending and then stack all the other scenes in the middle with connecting tissues between them. And they can go this way, this way, this way, this way, if they want to, or they can go this way, this way. It just sort of depends on what the heroes connect with and try to mm -hmm. vary it all. It's pretty. I have a question for all three of you. So when it comes to creating or crafting this sort of, you know, you've got sort of the things that people do to onboard and the fun kind of, you know, mystery part of it. Do you create alternate uh, endings or uh, occurrences if people mess with your business like do you just sort of have you been known to do that or is that a thing that that even is fair or you know considerable or mess with our business yeah like you know for instance <laughs> if, if players yeah when players are messing with your business like when they if, catch when they catch on or they get to the, to if, the if end. players completely train wreck the plan plot you mean yeah, yeah. of course mm -hmm. you, I mean, you mean like they they always invariably do, do? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, my mean, solution is a bathroom break 
<laughs> While we go and figure out what the heck's going to happen That's next. Happen next. <laughs> yeah, my usual solution for that is, well, I mean, it, it pretty much always happens, so you have to be mm -hmm. prepared for it. But my yeah. usual solution is take what I've prepared that would have spoon-fed them everything and translate that into defenses they have to get through to mm -hmm. reach, you know, what they've decided is the end. So, like, you know, if if the inciting scene is you have to stop the power core from stealing the baseball diamond, and the end scene is you have to stop Mastermind, who's about to use a mind control satellite to eliminate, uh, let's go with show tunes on Earth. Oh, <gasps> sure. yeah, please. What a monster. Which, I gotta say, after the Beetlejuice musical has just been renewed... We have to stop him. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah. So if in the middle you've got to fight, you know, a cadre of cold wheeling villains to learn about uh, Mastermind's secret Broadway missile control silo. Uh, <laughs> but you just, after beating up the power core, use your super senses to figure out, oh, they're working for Mastermind. He's on Broadway. <laughs> Right. Uh, go. And you just head out there. Well, then I just translate the the cold front, the villains, the ice villains who you'd have to beat up otherwise, to you know, they're already back at the missile silo. They've gathered the other things off screen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah. the heroes have to fight them as they approach. Yeah, I definitely. like it. If they can make it there, you know, <laughs> yeah, they can make it anywhere. <laughs> speaking, uh, speaking, kind of what Crystal's talking about. Um, I always say that nothing's true until the players see it. Yeah. So nothing exists. But sometimes anywhere. not even that. Yeah, <laughs> not even right? that. But like, <laughs> if you prepare something, it doesn't necessarily have to be where you initially prepared it. If you just yep. shuffle it over there in front of them when they get where they're going. Yep. And change some of the set dressing a little bit. And never yeah. underestimate the value of illusion powers. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah, I've, I've often played the it was a robot gambit. Mm -hmm. you know, or things of that type when players jump to, you know, the the scene, the climatic scene, and it turns out, well, this isn't actually the master villain, it's their proxy, or it's mm -hmm. a robot duplicate, mm -hmm. or it's an illusion, or something like that, and their real plan is over here. Imagine you're at a convention and you you step into the restroom and you see a pacing, mumbling, grumbling, <laughs> Chris Pramus. <laughs> I mean, you like, can step oh, into our booth and see a mumbling, grumbling, pacing Chris Pramus. That is true. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> that visual, I just love it. I can just see it. You know, oh, this would be great if it weren't for the players. It's <laughs> <laughs> the best part of the That's the rallying cry of every GM, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're all Scooby Doo villains at heart. Yeah. That is true. That is very true. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, it's just an issue of, uh, I would like to work from an outline for my adventures. I think most GMs do. Most of us don't sit down and just write out, you know, exactly what each scene will be and some mm -hmm. read aloud text and things like that. The adventure is presented like that more for ease of GM digestion and ease of reading. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, in terms of setting up your mastermind plot, you need to figure out what the big goal is. Uh, in this case, you know, eliminating show tunes from all human minds. Uh, I assume you want a motivation. So why does mastermind want to eliminate all show tunes from human minds? Uh, because, you know, this affects, you know, how serious he's going to be about this project. It's going to affect, uh, you know, how players always want to talk down villains if mm -hmm. they seem especially sympathetic. So mm -hmm. if you know why he hates show tunes, you can really have, or, uh, you know, give players circumstance bonuses when they bring out related reasons. You can seed information in earlier scenes. Like maybe, maybe Mastermind what, or, uh, decided to try and sublimate a bunch of his rage by becoming a Broadway actor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the whole, the whole grind of, stage theater just kind of broke his spirit and he returned to super villainy. Mm -hmm. So if you can, you can reach into his heart and reignite his love of singing and dancing, then, you know, that's a nonviolent <laughs> resolution. And you could yeah. always spread like old 1930s, you know, theater mm -hmm. or uh, playbills, things like that, that show, mm -hmm. you know, master, eh, mastermind as the lead in 
our town. Mm -hmm. And you often get that um, common trope in comic book storytelling where the, the master villain will run a test of some sort of their, their master plan of some uh, kind. And it will oftentimes expose a flaw in it oh, yes. uh, that the heroes can, you know, the heroes can later on in the big confrontation say, but your plan to eliminate show tunes will never work because, you know, the theater that you tested it on, you know, demonstrated that instead of, you know, improving people's focus on the sciences like you intended, robbing them of art, you know, has simply, you know, destroyed their will to live and, you know. They can only communicate in show tunes now. <laughs> right, you know. <laughs> but you've eliminated their ability to sing show tunes. <laughs> They're trapped catatonic in their own minds. Exactly. We're all jellical here. We are all jellical here, right? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so so once you kind of know why your villain's doing their plan, and hopefully it's not just get rich and control the world, hopefully there's a little more nuance to it, um, mm -hmm. then you, like Alex said, kind of piece together your inciting incident and your conclusion, and then figure out what pieces fill out the middle. So, you know, what, why are the... Why are the power core stealing the baseball diamond for Mastermind? Uh, the baseball diamond is a giant diamond that works as a psychic refractor. Uh, cool. All right. Hmm. Well, probably he needs more than that. He's going to need a satellite. So he's got to get his diamond onto a satellite. So the power core, we're probably taking it to, let's go with Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Mm -hmm. Or or we have a space star city yeah, Star Island Space Center in uh, mm -hmm. Freedom mm -hmm. City. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so you know, does he have does he have some mind control scientists working there who are going to slip the jewel onto the the mm -hmm. satellite that's about to launch for him? Does he have an insubstantial or shrinking based supervillain there who's going to sneak it on board? Does he have a couple of villains he's hired who are just going to take over the space center and take over the uh, launch mm -hmm. and just you know, brute force, get that thing into orbit. Is it a multi-part plan where there's mind control scientists and a couple of, you know, hired supervillains in the wings just in case things go wrong? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and how many stages the plan has inf influences how long of an adventure you want mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Do you want, is this a one-shot single session adventure where the characters are going to learn about this plot and stop it? all in the same game? Or is this gonna play out you know, in a to be continued scenario that needs to play out over multiple parts? I wish I knew more show tunes so I could break in <laughs> better puns here. But... You know, I am furiously typing like show tune lyrics right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I spent my entire trip down in Florida mostly listening to the Beetlejuice soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've got one very specific show in my mind, and it's great. Mm -hmm. Everybody right. should go see it. It's, it's going to start touring again soon. <gasps> I didn't even know that was a thing. That's yes. what a musical. That's yeah. fantastic. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Beetlejuice stage musical, and the, the lead actor they've got playing Beetlejuice is very different from the movie character, but also just a delight. <laughs> I love it. That's really great. That what a great treatment. I would really that is like I never would even think of that. And I, I just it's a, an ideal um, little story for the for the stage for sure. I love it. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of who Mastermind's crew is and all this, and I'm like, Mr. Cellophane could be the invisible villain who tries to break into the satellite. <laughs> Is Mr. Cellophane just like a noisy clear person, like a like a? Clear oh yeah, he could become mm -hmm. invisible, but. He becomes uh, the inversely louder. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. He has a penalty yeah. to stealth. His main issue is he's very clingy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> that one hurts. Oh, oh, that's so good. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, speaking of musicals, you know, um, Sean Vieira oh, says that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Good. The Brave and the Bold musical episode. That's great. Yeah. With Neil Patrick Harris? Yeah, that was right. genius casting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Super but, good. So, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, once you've got kind of the stages of the plan worked out, because there might be other things. Like the power core might be coming from 
uh, Mastermind's old theater headquarters in the bad part of town. And so, you know, players find some evidence after beating them and they go investigate there to figure out what's going on. And they go investigate the space center to stop the launch. And maybe they succeed at stopping the launch or maybe they fail and you give them all hero points and it goes off without a hitch and puts the, the baseball diamond out of their reach. Mm -hmm. So that brings up a, a particular comic book trope that is often mm -hmm. a challenge in games is the let's split into smaller teams mm -hmm. uh, scenario of, of pairs or trios of heroes going, and going off in different directions mm -hmm. and doing things. How is that to run? It's it's frustrating to try and run because half your table is, you know, sitting there bored, not doing anything. Right. Realizing what, that what Facebook is down and they can't do anything. Yeah. yeah. One of the fun things you can do is hand them a villain character sheet and say, congratulations, you've been recruited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hey, that's fun. I like that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Forces them to pay attention, but it can make some some hard feelings. So it really depends on your table. Yeah. yeah it depends really on yeah, and how competitive your players are. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you hand them a villain and then they're determined to win. The, yes, actually, they go from normal person to, um, you know, uh, uh, the Hannibal Lecter in like two shakes. <laughs> like, it's like, come on, <laughs> not so bad. Not so villainous. Don't start eating people. Right. <laughs> turn, turn it back a notch. <laughs> just a notch. Just a notch. Right. We're keeping this four color. No killing. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, there's um there's something that I I do sometimes when hero groups split up where I'll make sure that we sort of go in initiative order of stuff mm -hmm. like handle mm -hmm. one group of people doing one thing, bounce to one group of people doing one thing, like give them a couple of actions over here back and forth, and then I try to make it so if there are conflicts planned in that area, we can do one big initiative, and I'll just run mm -hmm. the two combats at the same time. Oh. Just with that initiative order. Yeah, I've got a weird brain be, though, so that might not. That can be pretty everybody. effective if you can juggle it and keep yeah. track of where everybody is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, especially with all mutants and masterminds adventure, it's important to be doubling out hero points. But mm -hmm. when you're using a mastermind who has these Xanatos gambits, where even if they lose, they win, and something furthers their plan every time, mm -hmm. uh, it's really important to be just chucking out hero points whenever mm -hmm. you can. Uh, with sort of a sort of an understanding to your players, like, hey, you're gonna face a really big guy at the end of this, so hang on to these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Which, I mean, probably a good time to talk about how you make singular mastermind type opponents like really mm -hmm. imposing and dangerous. Oh yeah, yes. I like it. Uh, and we've we've presented it a couple of different ways. Uh, one of our early adventures, uh, Rise of the Tyrant. Uh, you face Conundrum as kind of a solo villain, mm -hmm. but you're facing him in his funhouse lair, which he's rigged with a bunch of traps. So basically every round, he's basically getting multiple attacks on you uh... based on where in the funhouse you are and what your actions are. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also got some minions in there. And for any good mastermind style character, you should give their minions interpose so that yeah you know you try to hit the mastermind and a minion either leaps into save their boss or the boss immediately pulls them over to use as a human mm. shield here a meat shield yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh and for um oh lord i am blanking our our big adventure path with dark magic and una another yeah. war another, another war. war thank you uh live sorry, tonight I at seven my, <laughs> my brain is very fried after this summer. No um, worries. But yeah, to make Una more of a threat, she's got what we are calling villain points that basically mm -hmm. function like hero points. Uh, when you, or when she spends a hero or a villain point, she can reroll an attack she just made or make an extra attack. Or we also gave her the option to summon uh floating shields to help defend her which are basically zero level minions with the interpose advantage yep interesting i have a question real quick oh go ahead steve sorry mm -hmm. no go ahead i was gonna ask what do you do in the instance when um two people play a hero they decide to choose a hero point like i mean is there is there a conflict to resolve in that am i am i can you use the hero point at any point in time like just whenever you'd like 
mostly on your turn. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it depends on what effect you're going for. But usually a hero point just goes off on your turn because you're, you know, re-rolling an attack you just made or you're adding an, one more attack to your turn or, you know, you're spending it to edit the scene. So you spend it as part of, I want to do this other thing. Like, uh, you know, he got knocked down last turn or on, on Strong Guy's turn. So I'm going to spend a hero point and say he fell into the trash compactor so I can just hit the button to uh, end the fight. <laughs> I mm -hmm. like it. I like it. You know, there or are some something like that. There's some yeah. conversations going on, um, um, you know, uh, as far as like when you have people running, you have your 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 party has split into different mm -hmm. groups. I just want to real quick touch on that. Um, nice to have visuals when running different combats. That's great. Mm -hmm. And um Let's see. Uh, uh, you know, um, Jonesy says mute. Jonesy, a... um, Jonesy messaged me. He was just he was muting himself in case there were another worse spoilers. Ah, I got it. I was like, is that a power? Because I don't, I don't have that power. Um, <laughs> he said, but... he said, tell me when it's safe to come back, and I told him it's safe to come back. Okay. Oh, I get it. He didn't want it. I oh, understand. <laughs> That's great. Um, what are you doing? Just... Bringing your players in here. Mm -hmm. Uh, just show is, up. They, show, they follow me around. It's great. <laughs> there we go. Of course. Yes. The robot yeah. duplicate always. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but I think the, the, the key point that Crystal points out when we're dealing with a singular mastermind in mm -hmm. uh, a game like Mutants and Masterminds is, is the action economy mm -hmm. is, yeah. is the fact that basically every, every turn, each of the heroes gets to do something and then the mastermind only gets one turn to do mm -hmm. something. And so we, you have to find creative ways to, to give the, the mastermind more options uh, so that they can effectively counter more of the hero's moves. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise the, it, it ends up being a really lopsided fight yeah. so far as that goes. Uh, but when you have things like minions and uh, duplication and, area effects uh, and uh, reaction uh, powers mm -hmm. and things like that, you can at least play out some options where, you know, there, there are more countermeasures for all of the things the heroes do. So it's not all, you know, just a matter of, you know, waiting for the villain to get their one action and then, okay, now the heroes yeah. go again. And I've got, a, I've got a personal trick I use for that a lot. I call the multi-villain where, mm. You use the same character sheet, but are effectively making them three or four villains. And you roll initiative for them, you know, four different times, let's say. Mm -hmm. And e on each turn, a, that villain gets to go again. And each mm -hmm. time it that player takes, or every time that villain takes damage, you apply it to whichever version of them just went last. And they start out overwhelmingly powerful, like most supervillain fights in comic books, but as the heroes sort of wail on them and, you know, use their best strategies, exploit weaknesses, you slowly whittle them down until mm -hmm. the players start getting the obvious advantage. Basically, yeah. every time every time they fail a toughness check by enough to knock them out, you throw out one of the three or four character sheets you're using. Mm -hmm. and, and they you know, lose those options. Mm -hmm. Yep, they lose. I've I've used this for a giant sentinel style robot before where each arm was a separate villain and the head was its own villain. Uh, mm -hmm. I've used this for Mastermind specifically, where I just basically had him go three times each turn. So he'd go more, mostly after each hero did as a retaliation. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be careful um... with powerful villains because, you know, three or four PL-14 attacks each round is a lot. It's punishing, yeah. 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 I actually borrowed that idea, Crystal, in my game that I ran this weekend because there was a situation where I was like, okay, Spider-Man's going to fight eight Sinister Six members. Is this going to be mm -hmm. the scene from Office Space except Spider-Man's the printer and they're all just beating him up? In the <laughs> nice. um, That's great. So they hey, were 50-foot well, tall symbiote Spider-Man and his arms, his legs, and his head all had different powers and they all went on different initiative counts. And they had nice. their damage tracks. Yeah, yeah I've, I've written a blog about this before where I specifically made a Cerberus and the main Cerberus and his two heads were mm -hmm. three different characters. 
And it's a phenomenal write up and you've got uh, nice. some some great advice. You've also got mm -hmm. uh, uh, some stat block in there for uh, for Cerberus. So um, yeah, so get yeah. over there and yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. check it out. It's really, it's yeah. free, very well written. Free stat block if anybody wants Cerberus. That's right. right. Yeah. Well, I, I need mean, that was... a Cerberus for something soon. Spoiler no, that's point. true because you've got yeah. players I, on the- I can tell you from experience, this is a pretty mean Cerberus. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, pretty good challenge for four PL ten heroes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've got to stop reading. This is great. This is good <laughs> stuff. It's not track, Troy. That's good, Troy. Right? I'm like, oh, whoopsies. We're doing a live broadcast. Um, Pook says, uh, I love using. Um, I love you. Uh, one of my favorite ways to make mm. it more interesting is to have a skill challenge mm -hmm. happening at the same yep. time. That's I fun. That. Yeah, kind of yeah. add some texture to the whole experience. Oh yeah, I, were you? I think. Oh. I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, just inserting a, a skill challenge to stop a timer or reverse it or mm -hmm. hopefully deactivate it is one of my favorite ways to add tension to a, a boss fight. So every turn, yeah. somebody's got to take an action to like hold the gates shut or hack a computer or something like that while everyone else fights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's helpful to give the the skill challenge some some narrative elements to it, mm -hmm. so it's not just a series of skill mm -hmm. checks. Uh, and there's there's a, lot, a little allows for some player creativity to come mm -hmm. into into play, so far as that goes, in terms of exactly how they're going to tackle the the issue. Yeah, that's what everybody lights up about with skill challenges whenever I'm running games and I bring up a skill challenge. They're like, I have narrative control if I succeed. Because oh, I'm like, this is what this check represents. You tell me what happens as you yeah. as you succeed or as you fail. Yep. I'll, give, I'll give them to them if they fail, too, if, they're, if I trust yep. that they won't do something wild. <laughs> I used to have an old D20 modern game where one of my players built the worst fighter ever who was also the best <laughs> hacker. And mm -hmm. every... Every fight was him trying to figure out how to use the environment to, you know, ad lib some kind of damage or effect. So I got a lot of experience to to educating things like that mm -hmm. on the fly. That's yeah. Awesome. So speaking of using the environment, that's another mm -hmm. uh, way to give the master villain a bit of an edge mm -hmm. is set them set them up in an environment that's either their home turf, like Crystal was saying about the villain's trap filled lair. Or you know the hero is having to uh, encounter an aquatic villain, you know, down in the you know depths of the ocean, uh, or the like. Uh, things where the uh, the villain has a home field advantage, and the heroes are dealing with conditions that mm -hmm. limit them in some way. We we saw some of that in um, a Cold Day in Midtown too, where mm -hmm. you know all the cold villains were in an icy environment, and the heroes had to deal with the fact that it was it was cold and slippery and hard to see. Oh yeah, we had to deal with that with uh, Into the Moon as well, mm -hmm. where yep. the players, the player characters, have to wear space suits, whereas the the space slime does not. Yep. So one of the suggested ways of slowing your heroes down is have an attack damage their space suit or space suit as a complication. Yep. Yeah, they really hate it when you rip those helmets off. Oh, they do. They yeah. do. Yeah. 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 But yeah, yeah. Fun thing you yeah. can do, like like fighting your underwater villains, is have an attack just damage their suit or their helmet and right. you know leave a player having to figure out what to do about that don't go underwater when crystal's running the game <laughs> right. no, yeah. no the rule is don't make fun of crystal's underwater villains <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> alex <laughs> What's Stop that? being so snarky all the time. <laughs> it's my superpower. But Axolotl was a perfectly good villain. <laughs> it's so cute. So cute. <laughs> that was my problem with him. <laughs> right. He had an axe. How was that cute? <laughs> oh, but he was so happy about it. Wouldn't you it. be? I would be. Smiley face and an axe. I would be. I do like... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I will say we do have an aquatic villain in an upcoming product who is based on a catfish, and she is terrifying. <laughs> well, catfish are pretty terrifying in their <laughs> They're way. They're nasty. They're nasty. I, <laughs> I got I got stabbed by a catfish. Uh, Oof. In my, the, her, the palm of my hand. I didn't mm -hmm. know that their little weird whiskers were also stabby 
it's um yeah. But yeah. <laughs> uh yeah and not that particularly tasty um you know what so. Right. I'm just saying the pain ain't worth the gain. <laughs> so, so does this does this aquatic villain also steal people's identities? Oh. <laughs> Pretend yes. to be people that they're not. <laughs> yes, that's right. I love it. <laughs> uh, that that is an insufferable joke. Yeah, right. This right, is yeah. the new astonishing adventure. Fifty first dates. If you mm -hmm. said, yeah. <laughs> Are they or aren't they? <laughs> the dating life of. The disembodied voice of Troy. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a very, that's going to be an oddly specific adventure, but uh, I'm right. sure there's an audience. Yeah. At so, least one. <laughs> so I remember speaking of now we're sort of into the, the end game, you know, with, with mastermind mm -hmm. villains. One thing that I try and keep in mind because you, you spent, you've spent basically the whole adventure up to this point kind of throwing things in the hero's path, you know, trying to keep giving them challenges, keep giving, you know, throwing barriers up in front of them, making things more and more difficult up into this final confrontation is to ask yourself in this, this sort of climactic scene, is it okay if the villain loses? Uh, and if so, let them lose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if the heroes have earned their win, give it to them. Because uh, oftentimes there's a temptation when you've built up all of these techniques um, and you've learned all of these ways to sort of snatch victory away from the heroes <laughs> prematurely, you know, so that they don't ruin, you know, your adventure or have it over in 10 minutes um, is, is to then stop doing that <laughs> at the end of the adventure. <laughs> right. and, you know, actually let them win rather than when they, you know, fight this titanic battle you know, to discover that, you know, it's really an animated mannequin and the villain is in his escape pod laughing at them and going, see you later, suckers. You yeah. know, it's well, when you spend a lot of time raising a child, it's really difficult to just let that child walk into the knife factory. Right? It's so true. It's so true. Well, and I think it's an important comic book trope to remember that villains often snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Like when they're on the upper hand and they just... They throw away their lead, and then the heroes. Oh win. yeah, one of the probably one of the best uses for hero points I've ever seen was uh, back in second edition. Over on the boards, somebody came up with the idea of spending a hero point to force a villain to monologue. Yep, Ooh, I love that. And that's that just, the entire just, plan. Yeah, it just stops the fight, gives your hero like just enough time to get their second wind, while the villain explains exactly what's going on. Yep. That is great. And then as the GM, you got to kind of hand it to them. I mean, like yeah. that's, oh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's fun. And then at that point you've done your job. Like you, that's a job well done. Yeah. That's so fun. Plus, I mean, it's basically the players asking you as the GM to lay out exactly how clever you think you are. Right. <laughs> that's the opposite of what usually happens. Usually you start monologuing and they punch you in the face. Yeah. Yeah. Usually mm. they stop you from monologuing. <laughs> but, right. That's so great. So um, we've talked. So we were talking about sort of like the 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 building. You know, when you're reaching the point where you know suddenly your your villain is uh, forced to monologue and share all the plans or or what have you. So uh, what is the mm -hmm. what is this particular caper? Is it are we still um, is it still mastermind uh, shutting down uh, show tunes? Curry <laughs> yeah. really wants to know how this ends. <laughs> I, I'm really invested. I really am. Well, I mean, that I, all depends on the players because it can just mm -hmm. be like a straight beat down. You know two fists up, just slugging it out. Or, you know, if they spell, spend their hero points wisely and, and are good with their perception checks, you could end it in like a battle of the band style, like mm -hmm. rap battle. <gasps> right? That's so great. And then it's, you know, performance checks against performance checks as a skill challenge to see who, you know, or, or a dance off or. <laughs> yep. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The celebrity yeah, hero never... getting a mastermind in touch with his agent so he gets a job on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never underestimate like how much fun it can be to turn a big fight into, you know, a series of skill challenges where, you know, one or two of your heroes are distracting the villain by, you know, dancing, singing, uh, mm -hmm. dramatic monologues, uh, while sure. the others have to sneak around and deactivate the the mind-altering 
strobe light laser. I, I, that is super fun. Like you, like, so you got to keep the villain's attention while you're doing some knockoff version of Hamilton. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it. it's a it's a time honored tradition to build villains or challenges that you can only beat that way. Um, mm -hmm. where, you know, the villain is, is just not something that you can, you know, blast or punch into submission, but you have to have some other way of overcoming them. Um, and you know, the, the, the final confrontation isn't really either isn't about combat where the combat is just a means to an end so far as that goes. Right. right. All right, so now you've got one person who's, uh, you know, extemporaneously singing uh, some version of Hamilton, and uh, the, the, <laughs> the party is trying to kind of figure some stuff out. You know, what is the uh, when you're building these? Uh, let's say it's a one shot where everyone's getting together. You're going to be mm -hmm. that what maybe you know three probably three hours, right? You can probably bank yeah. on three hours of time. What happens? Have you ever been in a situation where that that three hour window did not close? Yeah. Oh, I mean, all of the time. Sure. <laughs> Most yeah. adventures run long. Yeah. I mean, one Especially... shots, I was like, guess it's a two shot now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, my usual rule of thumb is, is that adventures will take longer than you think. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's generally not a need to overcomplicate things because once you get things into the player's hands, they will, they will ensure that it runs longer in some ways. <laughs> Yeah, and That's I mean, right. sometimes things will run shorter than you think. They'll, you know, figure out the end early and just cut straight to it. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's okay to throw random complications in, especially if it's a con game where, you know, people have paid for their four hours of entertainment. So you, right. you don't want to just, well, you guys got to the end boss in 20 minutes, so I guess the game's over. Uh, yeah, that's definitely the situation where you do want to be, like, have it turn out that this was a hologram or an ectoplasmic mm -hmm. duplicate or a life model jello mold. <laughs> uh, you know, the heroes beat it and, oh, this was just stage one in the elaborate master plan. And now we have I to get knew he was know, too back on the. Uh... Right. And now we're going to all take a short bathroom break. And... <laughs> That's right. We're going to figure out what act two looks like. Yeah, please enjoy the complimentary jello uh, yeah. sitting in the middle of the room. Yeah, it turns out Master Mold melts into a pile of lime slurry and pineapple, and now it turns out you've got to go track down the Gastronomicon. <laughs> right. I love that. Uh, a member oh. of the multiverse of Mastermind, the Council of Masterminds. Mm -hmm. I like it. Um, well, yeah, so... Um, I suddenly a craving for jello. I'm not a big jello fan, but I really, I don't know why that's really sticking with me. Um, so, okay. Well, so what, uh, how do you recommend, we talked about kind of the one shot idea, mm -hmm. but when it comes time to, to create sort of that longer term commit, committed story, mm -hmm. uh, you've got so much sort of under your, you know, under the hood, more to kind of do. Um, talk to me about just the the process of planning something like that, because it's, a, oh, you know, okay. you you don't may not mm -hmm. necessarily even want to, you may not know who the villain is for some time. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's just a long term sure. story arc. Oh know? yeah. Sure. Like what an, uh, I mean, when, a, when it's a whole campaign villain, uh, well, you might have it where the villain, you don't learn their identity until halfway through or until the very end. You just know them as, you know, the boss or le boss. Le <laughs> boss. <laughs> I knew um, it was that duck. It was Fabergé. All it's along, Fabergé. Right? <laughs> That's a fancy boss. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> um, but you can just have it be like, we know who the boss is, but we can't get to them. Like, mm -hmm. it could be like a kingpin situation where they've got legal immunity. So you, until you can figure out a way to make things stick like if you attack them then you become public enemy number one and you've got to deal yep. with the cops on top of trying to stop crime and all these other issues uh it could be you just don't have any way of reaching them they might have a lair at the bottom of the ocean or out in space and you just don't have the ability to get there yet 
Mm -hmm. uh, they could have a hidden layer that you can't find. Uh, they might not exist yet. If you're doing something like weirdly existential where, you know, the villain is a time traveler from the future and has set all these things up, but you know, they're not going to get their superpowers until you know, act three of your campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. or it could be, could be that they, you know, have been dead for a while and everything you're fighting has been set up in advance to Resurrect, resurrect them. them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the I mean, very the... first things I make is an org chart. <laughs> I know that's silly, but I, I pick my mastermind and I think about what mm -hmm. that person is interested in. Mm -hmm. And then I say, who would this person work with? And where would those people show up? And what, what are their skills? What would they be used for? And then yeah. I'll just go down and I'll start building story arcs around working your way up the org chart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've got, you know, kind of two approaches, you know, is the the shadowy mastermind mm -hmm. who has, you know, all sorts of, you know, is pulling the strings behind the scenes. And so it's the big reveal is, hey, all of these un seemingly unconnected things have actually been this one villain who has been setting all mm -hmm. of these things up um, to test the heroes or for any number of other reasons. Mm -hmm. Or you have the, you know, for lack of a better term, the the sort of unbeatable or uncatchable mastermind, mm -hmm. you know, who has some advantage, you know, like they can teleport away whenever they want and the heroes can't catch them until the heroes find some way to neutralize that advantage. Uh, then the, you know, the, the mastermind is just untouchable, you know, or even like, you know, the example Crystal gave of, you know, a kingpin type who just mm -hmm. seems yeah. legit. And until the heroes can really, you know, bring that facade down, they can't, they can't get at them. Mm -hmm. I like that. I, I definitely like the, the interplay of that sort of uh, the, the untouchable for whatever reason they're, you mm -hmm. know, because of time or because like they're a child, we can't do that. You know, like, right. uh, you know, the yeah. demon possessing the child's body, you know, we right. can't let the innocent host suffer, you know, we can just yeah. kill this kid guys. <laughs> yeah, right yeah exactly it, it is a kid yeah you know the um what i like about that too is that it does create moments of tension for the group to reconcile who they are as characters mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how they m will react you know in in kind of a moral way and uh and also sure. some clues to be found in that kind of mess mm -hmm. as to yeah. what the bigger picture is yeah that's fun yeah. conversely the villain can just be so astronomically powerful that the heroes have to find other ways to start they diminishing find their it. power or yep. yeah. you methods mean, that they can use to like to a gravy, I mean a salsa squatch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's like a gravy squatch at a party. That's uh yeah. You got way too much or you're having way too much fun with that one bit of clip art you found. <laughs> it's <laughs> so stupid looking, I can't stop playing with it. It's so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like it Alex is. was saying, have a villain who, you know, you can't even physically damage. Mm -hmm. Until you find, you know, the magic jewel that contains their soul or, you know, the the exact harmonic algorithm that shuts down their omni force field from the year 36,000. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah I like love all Superman. of this stuff. Yeah, it's like in mm -hmm. Superman the Animated Series when Darkseid showed up and just whooped him. And then yeah. it's like, you're beneath me. And he left. <laughs> and Superman had to figure out how to get around the forces of Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I have a question for you when you're when you're wrapping up one of these epic, um, you know, let's say it's four or five or even longer. I mean, there are a lot of people who just get together and play and uh, and have done so for decades. Uh, my question for you is, how do you go about recognizing, rewarding, sort of, you know, uh, uh, memorializing, you know, these events that have occurred, you know, at the end of a particularly uh, uh, challenging uh, success? Uh, I'd like to build in like campaign turning points. Like this might be the point where the heroes get a reputation or get a valuable mm -hmm. ally, or they are given, you know, a really cool headquarters or, you know, usually it's nothing that increases their power level, but it's something that yeah. makes the players feel <clears throat> like they've earned a, a treasure, a hoard. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. awesome. So more than than the enemy's head on a pike, but like some kind of an acknowledgement that they were yeah. well as a yeah. team. Here's your new offices. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. or it, it could just be like this big event coincides with you know the hero's girlfriend knowing things are serious enough that 
she proposes to him or, mm -hmm. uh, oh. you know, their, their kid graduates from high school that same week and, you know, goes off to start their own life. And mm -hmm. yeah. I like this. Yeah. Uh, new costumes all around. New costumes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. New writer like takes that. over. <laughs> <laughs> this is my. Yeah. Th this is great. Um, Sean Veer is talking about uh, an episode in Angel where the uh, demon. Yeah. yeah, that's so funny. The kid was the worst, and Angel had to get out. Yeah, yeah. That the demon had to get out. Get me out of this kid. <laughs> and I, yes. I like Stan and uh, Stan's over here talking about a team and a short story he. Our short campaign he wants to put together with La Boss and that gastronomicon and sentient right. Yeah, right. Yeah. I just want to throw out the best villain name that occurred to me, Duke Larange. Mm. Duke Larange. That's a good mouthfeel. I like yeah. it. <laughs> well, if you're doing it right. Yeah. No. Now, would we work in? The, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, would you work in the Gastronomicon as part of the Green Ronin canon? Um, I believe mm -hmm. that uh, Chris Primus talks about the Gastronomicon is already in yes. the HQ. So yeah. it's just got the list of all the best cheeses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's got all of the I most vile the fromage folio. recipes mm -hmm. for the most destructive recipes ever created from by uh, human hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will say this, we can cook the thing. I mean, maybe not mm -hmm. all of we, because we would mm -hmm. include me, and I'm not a very good cook, but <laughs> wow, uh, that Nicole, sh wow, the, mm, yeah. the cooking powers. Indeed. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. Horrible. Very, very good stuff. Um, I've never made cheese before, I don't think. I don't think I've made an accidental cheese. No, I hope I'm not. just going to say, is this something that happens accidentally? <laughs> I <laughs> assume the first time it had to be an accident. Had to be. Cheese. Had to be, yeah. yeah. I was like, I left my milk in this cave for six months and I found it. <laughs> and it's it. delicious. <laughs> this thing smells <laughs> like a corpse, but I'm going to taste it. <laughs> Would it be me? I um, mean, that's how we found durian, so. Oh, right. yeah, durian is pretty, that's pretty awful. It is. That's pretty awful. It does smell kind of smell like somebody put out a gasoline fire with um, cat urine. Oh, oh, it's so bad. And then it has this kind of vanilla custardy smell underneath it, and it, it's just gnarly. Um, yeah, I like to describe it as like an onion and diesel fuel creme brulee. That's it. Mm. That's good. That's very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. And the other mm. thing as well is those things are massive and spiky. So when they fall out of trees, it's not, uh, you know, unheard of that it would kill a person. <laughs> Just clobber them. <laughs> Those things are massive. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awful. I, I tried to. The person who ate one must have eaten one in vengeance of a fallen friend. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You killed just, my friend. I am going to consume you. I thought it was just going to be like some prudishness or something like, you know, like, let's be better behaved when we're on the subway. But in China, they won't allow you to eat durian, you know, and no. I had tried durian and I so and I went to the store and I was trying to uh, to find durian and to describe that I want durian. My Chinese, my yeah, it's not not super good. And uh, but I ended up finding it and they wouldn't sell it to me because they knew I didn't know what I was doing. And so <laughs> <laughs> so I had to come back with an adult, and then I got it. And it Explained was that you were giving actual giving consent. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Or that I would use it responsibly. Yeah, mm. yeah. Oh, it was nasty. Did, oh, so you passed your certification exam? <laughs> I did my durian certification. Yeah, it was. Uh, that stuff is just wildly nasty. And they—that uh, is a great concept for a supervillain, though. Right. Like bitten by a radioactive durian. durian. Now you're covered in spiky armor and you smell so bad. You know, oh, Dr. Durian. You. Yeah, oh. Dr. Durian. That's so good. That is a reason to hate the world. That mm -hmm. is. That really is. And only we could create such a monstrosity. Um, I love it. Uh, 253. What? No way. I was I just gearing up. There's so many more stories to tell about <laughs> durian. Um <laughs> Well, so you, you go ahead. We're gonna have to sit aside a week for for just durian stories from the disembodied voice of Troy. Oh right. yes, just durian, an hour durian of durian. Oh, mm. that's what I had to add durian ice cream. I, so the thing is, is I knew it was nasty, but I people kept saying, "Oh, but you haven't tried it this way. Oh, but you haven't tried it that way." And I'm here to tell you, all the ways are awful. It's they, always gonna taste like onion, gasoline, vanilla. It is. It's just gonna be warm or cold. Like it's just. <laughs> <laughs> It's so, you had it iced. 
Yeah, yeah. They're, they're like, well, I don't think you've had it as a popsicle. And I'm like, you know, that's true. I didn't. This is nasty. Oh, I don't it's think you've had terrible. It a, yeah, I don't think you've had it as a soup. <laughs> and the thing about it is when you get this stuff, you're not doing it at home because it's so pungent. You're doing it at a restaurant. Yeah. So people are under like, no. Oh, well, yeah, you definitely want to do it somebody else's place. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. They're you're like, not, are, yeah, never invite a dirty get into your home. That's how they get you. That's right. how, yeah, exactly. Once they cross <laughs> that threshold. The office. <laughs> Gross. If you Unless spread some rice on your door jam, they have to stop and count it before they can mm -hmm. come in. That's true. They have just <laughs> enough time to kick them down the stairs. Right. Uh, <laughs> onto some poor helpless person's noggin. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's uh, how variants kill people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I will uh, say that I'm so glad you're back in town, Crystal Frazier. It is a delight. Mm -hmm. I know that Aww. you've been, uh, you know, a, a kind of keeping up on all of the things and doing all of the stuff. And I'm just glad that you get to settle and hang with us today, uh, you know, from the, from the home base. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, uh, Steve Kenson, you are the best and Alex, you are as well. Pleasure. Do we have some other things that we want to talk about for this evening? Uh, any well, kind of stuff happening? I, I think we do need to remind folks that as I recall, we are not streaming next week. Um, because it is Indigenous Peoples Day. That's right. On the 11th. Uh, so uh, there will be no uh, Eminem Monday uh, that day, and folks will have to catch up with us in two weeks. You know what you can do in the meantime? You can head on over to the bundle of holding, beyondthebundle.com, and you can pick up two of the uh, bundles. We're in two bundles. Nice. That's very nice. That's true. Good stuff. We're talking um, uh, Eminem Earth Prime Bundle and the Mutants Power Up. Uh, at the Eminem Earth Prime Bundle was resurrected from 2019. That's how good it is. They just brought mm -hmm. it back to life. So you mm -hmm. pick both of those up, and it ends uh, today. I was just going to say, today is the last day. It's the yeah. last day. If you want these, get, get out there. If you want yes. gift PDFs for your friends to recruit them into our sinister cabal, right. now's right. the time to do it. Now's the oh, time. Wait. And next Monday is Canadian Thanksgiving, so oh. even better that we are not streaming. <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome. And thank you for watching, Rainbow. Um, so glad that you enjoyed the program today. Um, you know, and this is just the way this works. It just cracks me up. We have the in the final in the final moments, we have questions like this. <laughs> what book should I get question. if I want to play and or run mutants and masterminds? What are the essential? Oh, <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> um so Easiest way to get started is with the Basic Heroes Handbook. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got very quick and easy character creation rules uh, and, you know, a couple of pre-made adventures, some pre-made villains, and a pretty straightforward explanation of, you know, how the rules work along with, you know, yeah. illustrative comics explaining some of the weirder concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, the Deluxe Heroes Handbook gives you a much wider variety of character creation options, both for heroes and for villains. Um, so I like to think of it as buying your car off the rack versus, you know, putting your car together from parts you custom order. Um, and then once you've got that, I really like uh, one of the villain bestiaries, for lack of a better term. So Threat mm -hmm. Report or Rogues Gallery. And then a campaign book like Freedom City, which also contains a bunch of more villains, of villains or yeah. Emerald City, which has some more villains and a whole campaign of adventures built into the back. Um, the Deluxe Game Master's Guide is a really helpful sort of multi-purpose tool for when you want to get under the engine and start making your own adventures. And it's got a bunch of generic villains and generic mooks. Uh, you might want to pick up a couple of Astonishing Adventure PDFs, just as a quick example for, you know, how to put together adventures, balance encounters, you know, how how scenes flow together, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, we've got a bunch of different sort of genre books, depending on the kind of game you want to run. So if you want to do, you know, something based around teen heroes, then Hero High is great. If you want something based that's more like like the Loki series where your, your hero's time hopping to mm -hmm. try and solve crimes, or if you want to set your game in a different time period, like the 1960s, or have Victorian superheroes, then the Time Traveler's Codex is great. Um, if you want to do something that's more focused on magic or, you know, supernatural, angel, Buffy, uh, mm -hmm. 
Hellboy. I should really know mo more modern ones. Uh, the Supernatural Handbook is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, we've put out a lot of books, haven't we? You want to do like yeah. Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy, you can get the mm -hmm. Cosmic Handbook. Oh, yes. You know. mm -hmm. One of my personal favorites. Um, and uh, one more, the, the Power Profiles PDFs give you a great range of of powers that are sort of zoomed in on because the mm -hmm. the power building rules in the Deluxe Heroes Handbook are very effect based. So you have you know damage or uh, flying or things like that, but it doesn't really tell you what to do if you want you know my hero my I'm playing the Human Torch who turns into fire right. and he controls fire, but there's right. no powers in this Deluxe Heroes Handbook called fire. Well, if you go pick up the power profile fire powers, a whole chapter of them. Yep. Yeah. It tells mm -hmm. you like, hey, here are, here's how you use the effects in the main book to get these different fire powers. Mm -hmm. So, and, and uh, the bundle of holding is all PDFs, no print copies. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So yeah, get you over there to pick that up, and then um, you know because we are um, uh, because we can do it. What I'm going to do is create a discount code for people who are watching this. I'm not going to talk about it Ooh. anywhere else but Ooh. here and it is going to give you 15 percent off of um anything that you pick from the uh from mutants and uh masterminds mm -hmm. hq and all you have to do is type in i love m a n d m monday so it's uh <laughs> yeah that's all you got to do you got to type that in and uh mm -hmm. the code is in the chat one second i will give it to mm -hmm. you um and uh, yeah, go buy yourself, buy yourself something nice. Right. And that <laughs> will include print copies, right, Troy? That includes print copies. Mm. We are just nice. that kind of generous, yeah. Sweet. Absolutely. Troy likes people to have our books. Really I know. Know. Just, we don't make really any money good. off it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my villainy, a good bargain. <laughs> right. Well, friends. Yeah, yeah, you got to go. Um, uh, thank you again, everybody. Uh, don't forget mm -hmm. to go check out our Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash mutants, A-N-D. Masterminds, we'll be getting some updates mm -hmm. to you very shortly. And um, other than that, have a great week, and we'll see you Thursday with Owen Casey Stevens on oh, Thursday. Yes, and, yeah, Master the Game, that is for, yes, the Green Ronin store, but it's only yes. for the Mutants and Masterminds products. That's right, that's right. I'll I'll, uh, I'll make sure that we drop a link um, uh, to the uh, uh, m m HQ, so. Awesome, okay, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I'm wearing, I am wearing headphones, but you know what? That's it, friends, everybody. I uh, much love to you all. We will see you later, bye-bye. Right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> bye, everybody.